Greetings, science fiction and fantasy enthusiasts. Do you read books? Do you watch films? Do you hate deodorant? Then welcome to our podcast. You're listening to No Deodorant in Outer Space with Ryan Sean O'Reilly. Now, let's get started. The true secret in being a hero lies in knowing the order of things. The swineherd cannot already be wed to the princess when he embarks on his adventures, nor can the boy knock on the witch's door when she is already away on vacation. The wicked uncle cannot be found out and foiled before he does something wicked. Things must happen when it is time for them to happen. Quests may not simply be abandoned. Prophecies may not be left to rot like unpicked fruit. Unicorns may go unrescued for a very long time, but not forever. The happy ending cannot come in the middle of the story. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of No Deodorant in Outer Space. My name is Ryan Sean O'Reilly, and I'll be guiding you along this fantastic journey as we explore um, magical forests full of, well, full of one unicorn at least. Um, <laughs> uh, joining me on this adventure is my cousin, Kaylin O'Reilly. Hello. Kaylin, how are you doing today, this evening? I'm doing great. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> I've brought you back. You were on the podcast previously when we covered uh, Charles Beaumont and Rod Serling. We did like the Twilight Zone and Beaumont stories. Yep. Now we're having you back to cover... The Last Unicorn, written by Peter Beagle, and the movie of the same name, which was directed by Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass, and starred Mia Farrow, among others. So, Kaylin, mm -hmm. on the last episode you were on, I think you kind of let the audience know a little bit about, uh, you know, who you are and what your interests. I know you read a lot. Sometimes you do a video blog on YouTube about your reads. You're active on Goodreads. Is there any other information you could just tell our listeners just to familiarize yourself a little or familiarize them with you about what your interest is in reading and i mean if any if you have any tendencies or any your interest in science fiction fantasy or horror okay all right yeah i mean avid reader i've always been a reader started when i was young with my mom she's an avid reader as well and she got me into it started with the cat in the hat really i have a book tube YouTube channel. It's called Kaylin Reads. And I just basically follow the books that I'm reading, what I want to read, and I kind of do monthly wrap up and the books that I'm planning to go for. And as far as uh, science fiction, fantasy, horror, I have, I, I really enjoy the Twilight Zone episodes as well as um, the Charles Beaumont uh, stories that preceded them and um it's the last unicorn and i've read tolkien the hobbit and for horror i've gotten into stephen king okay. uh, a little bit of thomas h cook is kind of more of thriller but a bit of horror as well so yeah kind of a little mix of things cool all right well that's a little bit about you like i said we're covering the last unicorn so I'll start off the show with us doing our opening salvos. But before that, I'm going to open up some alcohol, because why not? Mm -hmm. um, I have a Bourbon County brand stout from Goose Island. I think it's the year 2017 that I picked up for this special occasion. And if the listeners don't know from the last episode, Kaylin is actually my cousin. That's why we say, share the same last name. Oh, yeah. So we'll go ahead and provide... And being Irish, you know, being Irish, so we... It, it's sometimes a good idea to break that out. <laughs> Although I'm I'm without, so it's too bad I can't share some of that with you. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> we this is our we were we we're gonna tr try to record this in person. We were both doing a movie shoot with your brother Michael Riley, who's been on the podcast before, but yep. we we got a little too busy uh, with the movie shoot. Yeah, yeah, takes a lot of time, so. But here we are now, so... Here we, now, here we are now. We're making it happen. It's about 8 o'clock Central Time. I'm outside Chicago. You can hear the birds still chirping. Sometimes you might hear some traffic or a train in the background. Not all the, the sounds you'd hear in a magical forest, but maybe some of them. So we're kind of making it work with a little bit of the ambience. 
Uh-huh. Can use your imagination. Yeah, maybe it's a magic train, like the Polar Express or something, or a magic truck, like, mm. like uh, what's that it's truck that the kids truck show? Thomas. Isn't Thomas the train? Thomas the train. No, that's the, that's the train. I'm thinking of the train, trucks and trains. Bill the Builder. Uh, I, don't I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I was thinking Bob the Builder too, but isn't that that's kind of like a construction worker? Oh, I thought. Yeah. But yeah. we both thought of it, so maybe maybe there are trucks. I don't know. Maybe there's <laughs> construction work going on in this magical forest right now. Sure. There could be. You never know. True. So I usually like to start off the show with um, an opening salvo, just like a one-sentence summary of your thoughts about the book to just kind of set up where your head is before we get into the comments. So if you want, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I will let you go. Okay. So my opening salvo for this, for this episode is going to be magical prose that flows in lyrical quality and somber notes in deaf creation of, of a profound myth that is familiar and yet completely unique, hope and regret and joy and sadness, a complete and wondrous tale. So <laughs> that probably gives you a somewhat indication of uh, my read on this. What about you? Do you got like a little summary of where your head is at on this? Try and follow that up. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything written, but I would say it's very, it's very swiftly paced, magical story that kind of reads like a song like you said it has that lyrical quality and i'd say it's filled with pretty round characters uh, that are um, interesting and very different and it's an adventure story but it also has a really good touch of humor in it as well and it's kind of that your classic fairy tale it's got the romance to it and it's got the magic in it and it's got the funny characters and the scary characters so it's a good it's a good mix of a lot of uh interesting elements to it that make a really good fantasy fairy tale so yeah all right that you, got, sums that up. you got a couple sentences in on that uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right that's something we used to always well, struggle with in the previous seasons it's hard to sum up your thoughts real quick unless you write them up ahead of time like i do and then i would usually get made fun of by the other guys for doing it okay but, well, well next time next time i'll remember <laughs> yeah next time next time you can make fun of me now oh finally if there's someone else i can make fun of mm-hmm. so this is actually the first time i'm doing just a, an episode with one other person and we're doing it over the phone huh. which um instead of skype which ho- hopefully that'll be good because we don't have to deal with skype problems it's you might have a little bit of the phone quality to the audio but it's going to be just the two of us on this episode so you should feel lucky that you're this is the first time i'm just doing a one-on-one with someone i should i should uh, and the listeners should feel lucky yes <laughs> that's right <laughs> all right so this this book was written by peter s beagle did a little research on him and i think you did as well so i'm going to just kind of go into a brief bio on him on his life and we'll do that before we get into our book discussion peter s spiegel was born april 20th 1939 he's still alive unlike some of the other authors that we've covered on this book He grew up in the Bronx. He came from an artistic family. He had some uncles that were Russian-born, social realistic painters that came to, that I guess emigrated to New York. So that's kind of like his background. I I listened to some interviews on podcasts, and I also watched some talks of his on YouTube. And one of the stories he likes to tell is that when he was growing up, he had an Irish teacher, so that, you know, touches on the themes of our last name, which you were just talking about, Kaylin. But he had an yep. Irish teacher that he was particularly fond of, who I think sort of inspired him to write and told his parents not to worry about his social awkwardness and stuff. I think there was some point where he was sick. I forget. Maybe he has he had some breathing asthma kind of problems or something like that. And she gave him a copy of The Wind in the Willows while he was convalescing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that he remembers that, so that was important. I think when he, he read that, he, he was like, yes, I want to do this someday. Mm-hmm. That was one of the early things that inspired him. He, he also has mentioned when he was growing up that he used to write stories about Tarzan and the Lone Ranger, so those were things that he liked. 
In schooling, he got some recognition for his writing. He got a scholarship for a poem that led him going to the University of Pittsburgh, where he got a degree in creative writing. And then he did a postgraduate fellowship at Stanford University, where he had classmates uh, among the names of Ken Kesey, who was the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Larry McMurray, right. who did Lonesome Dove. Those were some heavy hitters, mm-hmm. although I don't think he mentioned that he was like friendly with them or anything. He didn't seem to mention anywhere about having any kind no. of relationship with them. But still, it sounds like it was a pretty good program. Mm-hmm. The, I think the the last unicorn, I believe, was his second book, right? I think the... I think his first book was A Fine and Private yeah. Place. Was he yeah. 19 when he published that? Or uh, lo- yes, I did read that he was 19. Uh, I think you, it said uh, uh, 1960 that A Fine and Private, Private Place came out. So it actually says he was 21, but I think he was 19. That probably means he was 19 when he wrote it or when yeah. he started writing it. So I guess if it was 1960, he would have been about 2021 20, when his first came out still that's pretty amazing yeah um he's like a prodigy yeah. <laughs> or yeah. i mean that's very young mm-hmm. um the only thing only one person i can think of is se hinton who wrote uh, the outsiders i think was 16 when she wrote that book oh really so, that's but, but other than that that's I, mean, pretty I, don't, young. I don't know how many yeah <laughs> so she has him beat there but still i don't yeah i haven't heard of a lot of authors that have, have started you know producing that young before. Yeah. He started early. (laughs) Yeah. So the last unicorn, which we're covering, the writing about that, the the little story that he tells about that is that he thinks that he took inspiration when he was younger. He visited his mother's classroom. I guess she was a teacher. I think she told him later that he made up a story about unicorns for the class. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He also recalled reading a book called The Cult from Moon Mountain by Dorothy Lathrop which has a story about a unicorn in Kansas. I'm, I'm getting this most of this from Wikipedia. Someone also gave him a painting of unicorns fighting bulls when he was 17 by Spanish artist Marshall Rodriguez. He, he re- remarked that once he had the idea, he did research on unicorns over at the Pittsfield Library. Now, another interesting quote that I heard him say was that he didn't consider this book, The Last Unicorn, a work of inspiration. He considered it more a work of desperation. When mm-hmm. he was 23 years old, he went with a painter friend to stay in a cabin to do an artistic retreat in the Berkshire Hills. The kind of the deal that they had was he was going to work on his writing. So he was already published right. at that point, but he was still young, 23, and his friend was going to do painting. So they'd get up in the morning or whenever they got up and his friend would go off and paint this landscape. And then he'd be at this cabin alone and he'd kind of feel pressure because every time his friend would come back later on in the day, his friend had more paint on the canvas. So he was like, I gotta, I gotta churn something out. So he started, you know, putting, yeah. putting words on the paper. This was what resulted in his first draft manuscript. A lot of it was abandoned, and he rewrote most of it two years later. Yeah, I heard, he read, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think he, he wrote, I think he had said I'd seen him in a video, he, he wrote something like 80-some pages Yeah, when he was in the cabin, and he ended up ditching most of it. He's he, he chucked most of that. So, I mean, it, was it productive, the time that he had in that cabin or not? I mean, I guess it led to, you know, the book, but he, he threw out so much of it when he was there. But I guess it kind of probably sparked, yeah. you know, at least the beginning of it. The seed of the story and came, I, yeah. And I think he and his friend probably had, you know, it, it, it probably worked, the two of them working together that they could kind of compete, you know, with each other. It meant made made them motivated to you know produce their own stuff because you know if your friend's doing it then you feel like you have to peer pressure you know, keep yeah keep up along with them so i think they were kind of using each other to kind of you know keep the creative juices flowing or whatever he, so. he, he reflected later or he talked to his friend later and i think his friend who he thought was being so productive with this landscape his friend said that he hated the landscape he created <laughs> Uh, and yeah. and, Be- okay. and Beagle threw out most of what he wrote, so it's kind of interesting that they both yeah. felt this pressure. But, you know, the artistic process is not always straightforward. So this no. is sometimes mm-hmm. how it works, I think. He credits his wife. He, he married a woman who I believe already had three children yeah. for 
getting him to finish his story. I think she must have looked at the first draft and, and told him he had to get back to it. So within like two years later, he got back to it and he ended up finishing it. He also had some pressure, I think, at that time to start providing for family. I think did he yeah. do a little like uh, nonfiction writing for like Seventeen magazine? I thought I saw that somewhere. I don't remember yep. if it was correct. Yep, he started doing paid work. I don't know if the paid work was in Seventeen or not, but he did write a like I think he got a short story published called like the telephone or the phone call, the telephone call. I, I'm not sure if that was, again, through 17 or another publication, but I think that was a short story. And again, I, 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 I don't know if that was the first paid job or not, but I think that's kind of, he did some stories here and there. So. Well, it sounds like his life shifted. Like he, at first he was very young, he published a book and he was kind of carefree. And then he falls in love with a woman who already has kids, they get married. And now he's like, oh, I need to start making money mm-hmm. so maybe that's yeah. when he starts getting a little he bit more not. serious about the writing even though he'd been successful already yeah i mean going and then going from just supporting himself to yeah. having you know instant four, family yeah. more people suddenly so yeah so that is what resulted in this great work the the book has sold um, over 5 million copies. It's been translated in over 20 languages at least. And in 1987, a poll in industry magazine Locus, it was ranked in number five among 33 all-time best fantasy novels. It's it's widely praised and regarded as a, a classic of American fantasy. I think he kind of didn't write much more about unicorns or this world for some time. He even made a comment in one of those videos that he didn't consider himself very big on unicorns. People would always come up and talk to him about unicorns, and he wasn't really that crazy about unicorns. He eventually did come around <laughs> and write sort of like, I think he did a sequel novelette that might have won um, uh, yeah. some, some awards and did yeah. some short stories that were bundled up. I think they refer to the novelette almost as a coda. Is it called Two Hearts? I can't remember. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I, you can get it actually online for free. Oh, really? Um, Yes, I did see that. There was a link to it. I think it was off of like maybe the Peter Beagle website. I don't know if that's official or not. But you're able to get the... You could read the sequel online. And I just I just kind of clicked on it. It's not very long. Oh. I didn't read it, but... Oh. Yeah, the, you can... It's, it's Two Hearts. Yeah, it was published in 2011. It won a Hugo Award and a Nebula Award. Okay, those are the like so, two major awards in the science fiction uh, yeah. fantasy world. Yeah. So that was considered a novelette. So yeah, so so short, short read. Yeah, and then he's got other short stories I think that have been bundled up um, about the various characters. I think that there might even be some stories mm-hmm. about different unicorns, um, besides stories about er, uh, earlier stories about some of the characters yep. in, in the last unicorn. The, U- the unicorn sonata is another book he published. I think it's about a young girl who possibly meets unicorns but it's not it's not related to the last unicorn so it's just another i think novel that features unicorns but oh and i you know they did a special edition of the last unicorn where they included his first manuscript his his early draft of it as bonus material i I forget who the publisher was who did that but it was might have been a limited run, but they, he did release that early draft, which I guess is kind of different. I think the unicorn, there might be like a demon involved or something. It, it, oh. It's quite different. So if you're really into The Last Unicorn, you can check out his early draft if you can find a, a copy of that limited edition, which includes it. So there's a lot of unicorn stuff out there. Now, um, another thing I noted about uh, Peter Beagle, oh, bef- before I get to that, the friend he did the artistic retreat with, I believe it's the same friend who was the painter. At some point, they traveled the country. They might have gone across the country to meet with his wife because I think Peter Beagle eventually settled in California. Yeah. But he traveled the country by scooter with his friend, and I think mm-hmm. he wrote a book about that at some point, too. Yeah. Yep, that was I See by My Outfit. Ah, that's what it is. Which is a okay, memorable yeah. title because I remember doing research for this and seeing that title and I was like, I don't remember seeing that title before It's kind because of, it's kind of, you know, it's one of those titles that is strange and <laughs> you don't yeah. really know what it means, I guess. But yeah, when I saw that, I was like, oh, that was Peter Beagle who wrote that. But yeah, that's, that's his nonfiction. It's like a travelogue or something. That. Yeah, and I remember, I think he said he had some of the best times ever, like, going yeah. on that trip with his friend, and that would be interesting to read. It's almost like, a, it makes me think of, like, Steinbeck travels with Charlie. Hmm. Um, just a road book, you know, just like a going, yeah. 
you know, cross country with your friends or your dog or whatever, what have you, you know, but it, it's traveling like Bill Bryson kind of thing. He told, a, <laughs> he, he told a story on one of his interviews about getting pulled over in some small town by a police officer. And I think at that point, his friend didn't have a license, but he did. His friend mm-hmm. would just write on back. He had like a certificate from the International Scooters Convention or something, some, some kind of certificate that, that wasn't recognized by the police officer or something like oh. that. And it's like they had to like figure out how to get out of that town. I think he had to train his friend on how to drive the scooter just enough so they could get out of that town so that this, they'd be out of this cop's jurisdiction and then they could switch over to him. So this was like before his friend knew how to drive a scooter. And eventually I think he did get his own mm-hmm. after that. So, yeah, he, he loved scootering around and had all kinds of adventures. Traveling shenanigans. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing I wanted to mention is when you look up Peter Beagle on the Internet, he has had some disputes with his business manager. He was involved with a lengthy legal battle with uh, the gentleman's name is Connor Cochran. He's this, no longer his right. business manager. There was a lawsuit. There was allegations of fraud, defamation, elder abuse, and breach of contract. I think there's also might have been some legal action. I I can't remember. I, I didn't quite verify this regarding the yeah. the movie, but there was all kinds of legal mm-hmm. battles going on. I think there was still stuff going on this year in 2018. I'm not sure if it's completely resolved. I think there's been some resolution, um, but it, I, I'm hesitant to say that the whole thing's resolved. But there was enough legal stuff going on that there I found a, the, a Snopes article where Peter Beagle, I think, had to create his own website to tell his fans that despite Mm -hmm. rumors to the contrary, he was not destitute, he was doing okay, and he didn't really want Mm -hmm. his fans worrying about him, and they can just focus on enjoying his work. Like, I think he feels he lost out on some money. Obviously, he was involved in some legal action. Yeah. But, you know, he's not on the streets. He's okay. So (laughs) So, there was... So, yeah. Yeah, so if you... Yeah, I... I, Go ahead. mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I... it doesn't get too in depth with any of those. I don't know if it's pers- like uh, classified or something. You know, some things that they weren't able to publish. But he had a dispute with, I think, Granada was the, maybe the production company. Oh, the British company that uh, owned regarding yeah, his the movie. Film. Yeah, yeah, for his film, he was entitled to five percent of the royalties, I believe, for the film and for the merchandising of the film. And somehow, I guess he wasn't getting it all. I don't know. I think that might have been resolved with because recently there was an anniversary of this film, maybe the 30th or um, help me do my math here, 35th or something, or 25th maybe. Uh, if you look at the DVDs, like there's a new cover. So I think yeah. they might have resolved that because of the new edition coming out. With, I think you're right. Um, yeah. So that, but I think that's unrelated to the dispute with his manager. Manager, because there's all I think there's all kinds of messiness going on with that. Because yeah. You know, like you said, elder abuse, and just, I think he claimed that fraud. Yeah. The, his manager was just trying to make money off of him, and and I think the manager uh, countersued and tried to claim mm-hmm. that he had written some of the yeah. stuff. Yeah, I'm hesitant to get and too, that he was yeah. getting senile and didn't know what he was talking about. So it sounds like a lot of um, a lot of bad tension between those two. Yeah, so I, and I don't know the latest about if they were able to come to I thought I saw that there was something going on in 2018 so it might not be fully done with the manager but I think you're right it might be resolved with the film company I mean I think the point is the last unicorn was a huge success for him that brought in a lot of money for a lot of people and then it, these fights result you know resulted with the manager and with the film company that had the rights to the animation so it's a very successful work Peter Beagle is he's doing okay, but he he's had some legal struggles over this right. property over you know through the years. But I think he's mm-hmm. in a better place now. It seems like yeah. If he's not in a, per- I think it's, yeah, I think it's safe to say that this would be his most popular and most successful work. Yeah, both in the film version or the the book version and then the film version. Yeah, if you see a, his books at the store, I think that's pretty much the only one that remains in print. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say the others were not a success, but this is all obviously the most well-known and successful that really kind of made his name. So. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, a book can be successful without being in print forever. It, it takes a lot for a book oh, to yeah. be 
always in print. Like, I mean, if you go to any bookstore, you're going to find the Lord of the Rings there. I mean, that's that's pretty right, rare, right, right. considering how many books mm-hmm. come out. So the last, this the is a huge, yeah, just, yeah, this book mm-hmm. is, is it's it's a huge, huge success by any standard. His other books probably were successful, but not to this like sort of immortal level that this this story has. But that he doesn't seem bitter about it. I saw him commenting about it in an interview, and he's like, you know, some better to be remembered for something than not remembered at all. Mm-hmm. You know, he actually said his favorite book that he wrote is I think it's the Innkeeper Song, which is not yeah. a children's book. That was his favorite book that he wrote. <laughs> and I also saw yeah. about him that he he's a musician and he likes to surround himself with musicians and plays, and and, and plays he plays music himself. Folk songs, I think. I think it was if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I think it was folk songs and yeah he plays guitar as well so yeah a neat dude <laughs> i know um have you ever heard of the author patrick rothfuss yes yeah he, he was the king Cr- killer chronicles that's which i yeah, read the name of the wind or the yes. name of the yeah something I, <laughs> and the wise man's fear right on the cover of this book is a quote from patrick rothfuss you know uh, about this book patrick rothfuss always talks about how this book oh, was, yeah. was huge for him growing up and I think he even tells a story uh, in an interview where he, I think he was at a party at some convention where he met Peter Beagle. So a lot of people drew inspiration for Peter Beagle. I think Neil Gaiman might have even has mentioned him. Neil Gaiman? Oh. Yeah, I think so. Probably. So that's pretty much all I have to say about, about Peter Beagle. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add that we haven't covered. Oh, um, no, I think you got it. Um, he does have, um, there are a few, you know, he does, he also is a screenwriter, we should say. Oh, yes. Probably. Yes. Um, yeah, he's written, he wrote the script for the film, The right. Last Unicorn, and that was, we'll get into that, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he wrote the animated, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah, film. true. I think the screenplay for that. No, he did, he the did, Rings. uh, The Hobbit, and he did The Return of the Return Kings. Of the Hobbit. There's a cartoon okay. called The Lord of the Rings, which was done by Bashy, which is different. There's, like, there's a, there's three films that were animated of Tolkien's works, and one was The Ralph Hobbit, Fox. which yeah. Peter S. Beagle wrote, and Rankin and Bass animated, who also did The Last Unicorn. And then Bashy, this guy, did a combination of the first two books, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring and The Two Towers. Yeah. And then The Return of the King wasn't done, so Rankin and Bass turned around and, and did that too. I don't know okay. if he did the script for that, but he definitely did The Hobbit. Okay, and he also, he wrote one Star Trek episode. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a f- popular one, I believe. I forget which one it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's, isn't it, it's in the cu- back flap of this, I think. Hold on. Yeah, the name yeah. of it escapes me. It's here. It's, uh... Sarek? <laughs> Sarek? Sarek, yes, I think you're correct. Called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it, S-A-R-E-K. Episode That's correct. In 1990. It was for so. the next generation. Yeah, next generation, which is my personal favorite, if I have to. Oh. the next generation <laughs> but that's a different that's a different story yeah that pretty much sums up peter s beagle i think from there we can move on to the book if you're okay with that all right sure All right, I guess I will try to give a synopsis of the book, and you can correct me where I'm wrong. So the book is... is, I'll do the best I can here. The book is about a unicorn, of course. It's about a unicorn that lives alone in a wood and learns from, I believe, a magical butterfly that it's the last unicorn. It doesn't believe this, but then it worries that it's true, and it decides to venture out from the protection of its magical wood and kind of goes on a hero's quest to discover what happened to the rest of the unicorns. It sort of verifies that the the unicorns are gone. And eventually, uh, the unicorn, she learns that a red bull has kind of herded all the other unicorns away. And this red bull is associated with this king, Haggard. The first thing she does is run into a midnight carnival that's run by this sort of, I'd say, low magic witch named Mommy Fortuna. Mm-hmm. She can do some magic, but not a lot. And she primarily takes creatures that are like normal creatures, like apes and tigers, and puts spells on them so that people will think that they're mythological creatures like chimeras right. and stuff. But she also has a real, uh, what's it called? Harpy. Harpy, that's correct. So she, Harpy, has, yeah. she, she does have <laughs> a, a real magic 
uh, a real a real harpy that's dangerous and she recognizes the unicorn for being a unicorn because we find out when the unicorn leaves its wood that it's not recognized by most people as being a unicorn it just looks like a normal horse so mommy fortuna right. captures the unicorn makes it part of her midnight carnival of display and puts it on uh part of her shows one of her workers is a also low magic wizard named Schmedrick, who recognizes <laughs> the unicorn as a real unicorn and helps the unicorn break free. The unicorn eventually gets free of Mommy Fortuna's clutches. Right. Sets this harpy free, which ends up, I think, killing Mommy Fortuna, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, yep. And, and then Schmedrick follows the unicorn off to go find where this Red Bull is and this King Haggard. They wander through the countryside and end up in some kind of town, I forget the name of it, which puts them among some bandits. Of them, mm-hmm. among That's the Hag's Gate. Mm-hmm. The town, the town is Hag's Gate. No, before Hag's Gate, I they run into the bandits. Isn't it? No, no, no. The, the oh. bandits are before Hag's Gate, I believe. Oh, okay. And, okay, my bad. Yeah, they're kind of living mm-hmm. in the woods off outside another town where there's this mayor. Among the bandits is a woman who sort of looks out for them. Her name is Molly Gru. She recognizes the unicorn. She befriends the unicorn at Schmedrick and joins their quest to go find the Red Bull. Then I believe they end up in this town called Hagsgate, which is just outside of King Haggard's castle. And there they learn that, that all the land that's under King Haggard's domain is sort of doing crappy, <laughs> except for Hagsgate, which is doing very well and has a lot of riches. And there's a lot of suspicion about this, that King Haggard had some kind of dealing with a witch or something, that he made some bargain where he'd have all this success, but he's living this sort of melancholy lifestyle where he has all the wealth that he wants, but he's never happy. Mm-hmm. So he's always kind of trying new things to see if they'll make them, make him happy, and they never do. When they... Yeah. I, is it before Hagsgate or afterwards? I think it's before Hagsgate, when they're heading towards Hagsgate and King Haggard's castle, a, a magical red bull appears and chases the unicorn, you're worried that something's going to happen to the unicorn, and Schmedrick the wizard turns the unicorn into... That's before, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, that's before that, because they arrive at the king, you know, after the transformation. <laughs> so, yeah, so she tur- yeah. So Schmedrick, who we should say, has problems with magic. He, he has no clear control of magic, but when he's stuck in a bind like this, when this Red Bull is coming after the unicorn, you think it's going to kill the unicorn, he manages, though he doesn't even know how, to turn the unicorn into a human woman named Lady Amalthea. Right. Molly Gru is upset about this because the unicorn shouldn't be turned into humans, but this manages to successfully dissuade the Red Bull from attacking the unicorn. The bull goes away, they're able to keep going on, and they're able to go and sort of, I guess, enter King Haggard's castle and become part of his court. King Haggard is suspicious of them, but because they don't have a unicorn, they're okay. So it's it's Schmedrick... Lady Amalthea, who's really the unicorn turned into human, and yeah. Molly Grew. The king has a son who's his adopted son, Prince Lear, who is sort of a nice guy. He has a lot of bravado. He instantly falls in love with Lady Amalthea, a.k.a. the unicorn, and tries to impress her by writing poetry, by slaying dragons, and bringing them the heads to her. She's very indifferent <laughs> to all his overtures. Schmedrick, Lady Amalthea and Molly Gru are all at the castle to try to figure out what's going on with this Red Bull and where are the unicorns. They're there yeah. for a while. Schmedrick man- manages to become the head magician for the castle because he impresses King Haggard, who has the most powerful wizard in the kingdom, but he's tired of it. That's to the the point of his uh, impatience or, or, or yeah. how dissatisfied he is with life. They're sort of. So he thinks, yeah, he thinks if he can have not good magician, that maybe he'll be, be entertained. happy with that because yeah. it's different. And yeah, and he's already had the greatest magician, so why not have an unsuccessful magician? And maybe that will make a difference. Yeah, he has the who's the, the the greatest magician? Is Mabrook? Is that that guy's name? Uh, yeah, yeah, Mabrook. I think is it. Yeah, great name. So they're there. They're kind of entertaining King Haggard, trying to keep a low profile and sort of investigate what's the deal with this Red Bull and where are the unicorns. 
However, we start to yeah. learn that Lady Amalthea is starting to forget the fact that she was ever a unicorn, and she slowly is sort of falling in love with Prince Lear. So now they're in danger of her becoming a mortal, because unicorns are immortal. <laughs> Eventually, there is a mysterious cat that makes some comments to Molly Gru about where they can find out where the Red Bull is. There is sort of like a mystery that involves a talking skull and a clock. Yeah. They go and investigate this. There's a sort of a kind of action sequence, and they end up in the lair of the Red Bull. The Lady Amalthea, a.k.a. the Unicorn, she is so much a human now that she sort of doesn't want to become a unicorn anymore, and Shmedrick and Molly Gru kind of are pushing her to fulfill her destiny. Remember, yeah. Yeah, remember what she came there to do. Yeah, although Schmedrick's sort of playing both sides. I think he's almost like using reverse psychology on her at that point. Mm -hmm. But the trick that she's now a human and the bull is not interested in anything but unicorns doesn't work. The bull chases them. Slightly before that, we find out King Haggard admits to the Lady Amalthea, a.k.a. the unicorn, that he did, in fact, capture all the unicorns by using the Red right. Bull, who herded all the unicorns into the sea, and so they're, all the unicorns in the world have been herded into the sea outside his castle and are trapped in the sea and can't leave. And I guess you can't quite see them, but I guess he can, because he knows they're there or something. And yeah. that, That's the one thing that gives him joy, is these trapped unicorns in, in, in the sea. The unicorn sort of has a last battle with the Red Bull, and she finally stands up to the bull, Oh, she's inspired by Prince Lear. He sticks up for her, and then the Red Bull, I think, runs him down. And then she gets angry about that, the Lady Amalthea, and ends up mm -hmm. standing up the Red Bull and forcing the Red Bull out to sea and freeing the unicorns who then escape the sea and leave. This undoes the curse in the land, so the land can now be profitable again, which makes the town of Hagsgate not profitable, You know, whereas the landscape was previously doing horrible and the town was doing good now the town is going to be doing horrible mm -hmm. and the land is going to be doing good and, and king haggard i believe is he, he dies at that point he's he dies right. with that yeah the, and the, the bowl goes back into the or she heard she's basically hurting him now and you know she was on the other foot so he she herds him into the sea and he kind of disappears into the water yeah. and then the castle yeah so I guess we're given full, full spoilers here. Well, yeah, yeah, we do full spoilers in the podcast, yeah, because okay. it, it's a review. Yeah, we don't worry about spoilers. So the way, right. the way it ends is there is kind of this bittersweet moment where the prince has fallen in love with the Lady Amalfia, but now she's a unicorn, and that's yeah. her true form. Yeah. And she doesn't turn back into a princess and marry him. She stays a unicorn and goes back to her enchanted woods, although she's forever changed because she has spent some time as a mortal. But she's freed the other unicorns, and Prince Lear is sort of bitter about this, but he's, I guess, happy for her, but also sad because he fell in love with her. Right. She has a sort of last touching moment with each of the characters, and it ends with a a wayward princess coming, wandering through the land and needing to be saved, and Prince she's pointed in the direction of Prince Lear to help her out. And the unicorn yeah. goes her own way, and Schmedrick and Molly Gru kind of seems like they have some interest for each other maybe love they're gonna go off and That's go what they, I thought, yeah. yeah they're gonna go I, was kind of, I wasn't sure about that but it seemed to be implied so. yes it's implied <laughs> yeah. yeah they're gonna go off and be together and prince Lear is going back to take over king haggard's kingdom he's gonna go back to being a prince and being a hero so that's the right. story that's the long version that's of the dumb. story okay it's a very long summary okay that's enough about the summary so the book we mentioned early on, and you talked about this, Caitlin, that the book has a very lyrical quality, and I always remember that Patrick Rothfuss would kind of talk about that. When I read this book, I actually read it out loud to myself. Every um, night okay. that I was reading it, I read it out loud because it's, I don't know, I feel like it's that kind of a book, and I wanted to do that all the way through. It's a little bit more work, and I was reading it to no one, so I might have been disturbing my neighbors. I'm not sure because I was reading it late at night, <laughs> but I would only read like a chapter or two at a time. There are actual lyrics in the book. I I'm not... A huge fan of songs and stories. I love Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. There's some songs in that. I'm not always right. so into it. I had some trouble following the rhymes and rhythms of the stuff, although I'm I'm not doubting that it's probably present and I just missed it the way I read it because I was just trying to read it through. 
But I found that even the prose itself, even the way the characters would talk, they would repeat things and stuff like that. And it all just had this sort of lyrical fairy tale quality about it, which yeah. s- sort of gave it some kind of special air. I mean, did you feel the same way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just the poems and the songs that came up, but just in his style, very metaphorical, maybe to a fault in some spots. There's a lot of metaphors. This is like this and this is like this it says a voice that sounded like a saw going through a tree and like a tree getting ready to fall uh that's just one example yeah but yeah there's a lot of metaphor but it's very i thought it flows pretty well i mean you it's a quick read yes you know yeah and the book is about 280 290 some pages but it's a bre- but, it's a yeah, breezy it's, to it's a breezy two hundred yeah, pages. Yeah, that's a good term for it. I think it's it's a breezy read. Yeah, and there's not, I think it's beautifully written, but the way a song would flow, kind of thing. That's that's sort of the way this book goes. Like I said, not just with the the song lyrics, but the prose itself is just kind of is lyrical. Yeah, in the way that the characters speak and the descriptions that he gives of the forest and the castle and the characters. So, yeah, it reads kind of like a long song. Yeah, but it's not so heavy-handed like a right, epic right. or something like that. That could like be that. annoying. Yeah, yeah. That, that, exactly. And that could be very, that could be annoying if it's too much. But it kind of, it, there are parts, I think, where it gets a little bit too metaphorical, but mm-hmm. but not, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's over the top. I, yeah. I think he paints a really good picture and a beautiful picture kind of of like I said, like of the land and the forest and the unicorn and everything else. So definitely it's done pretty well. Yeah. And I think also another tribute to this is it has a sort of humorous quality. It's not like a mm-hmm. sarcastic or, well, there is some sarcasm in it, mm-hmm. but it's not quite like the Hitchhiker's Guide it's, or a Terry Pratchett sort of tone. It's an understated, yeah, it's an understated humor to me, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like when you start with like the butterfly, well, that's kind of sort of almost a third, like the things that the butterfly says. It's just a lot of contradictions quotes, like, and quotes and contradictions and and just things that he's heard randomly. Like like he can only quote things that he's heard, but with not any of it having really a cohesive quality to it. There's elements uh, from like pop of, culture in it, right? Yeah, yeah. You mean with the butterfly yeah. specifically? Okay, I'm there- trying to find. Yeah, some of his quotes. There's like, I feel like he's qu- quoting snatches like songs from almost from like old pop culture Probably. or something like that. It's like I think, yeah, I think had I if I knew more about the time period, I probably would recognize. But he's saying like one, two, three, O'Leary, won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's all made up stuff. It seems like some of it's yeah. from our world. It says you're my everything. You're my sunshine. You are old and gray and full of sleep. You're my pickle face, consumptive Mary Jane. <laughs> you're a fishmonger. Yeah, just all these kind of random. They seem like quotes, you know, from something else. So that was kind of the first dip into humor. It reminds uh, me of the, the Cheshire book having a kind of a fun quality to it. <laughs> Ch- yeah. The what Cheshire Cat? Yeah, yeah, from Alice in Wonderland. Mm-hmm. That, that's how the butterfly reminded me. Yeah. Of. Mm-hmm. And there's that he asked, you know, why is a raven like a writing desk? Yeah, that's it's from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. There, so. th- this story, I, I say it's like a classic hero's quest, and it's almost, in some ways, although it's not a direct parody of the hero's quest, there are parody-like elements to it, where it's sort mm-hmm. of, this story is its own fairy tale, but it's also making fun of fairy tales. A bit. Yeah, and it, but then it, at the same time, it's kind of a tribute to them. Yes, yes, too, at the same the time. Because characters kind of fall in line in their roles. So it knows about fairy tales, so it's like commenting on fairy tales and the typical, like, elements of fairy tales. I don't like the pr- kind of the princess or the maiden in distress. And then there's the Schmendrick's kind of like a bumbling, yeah. almost side character and he's kind of the comic relief i think he's the bumbling he's kind wizard of kind of like a, yeah. a character out of, you and never... then molly grew of molly grew is the voice of reason yeah i think kind of yeah. character so and then there's the prince and the king of course so so they have these characters but yet they all they're not just their roles you know they they kind of flush them out he kind of flushes them out so that they have actual you know 
well, unique I felt, characteristics. Yeah, I felt these were memorable characters. They were very three dimensional. Yeah. They all like they're very all interesting and different. Like the like the prince is a hero. He's sort of this bravado like hero, which is almost to the point of a stereotype. But yet, you get the sense that he does care about the Lady Amalthea, the unicorn. And there's a quote where he's like, mm-hmm. where it's revealed to him that she's really a unicorn, and he, you know he's going to have problems being in love with her. And he's just like, lo- I yeah. love, I love who I love, I love who I love. And there's this like. Mm-hmm tragedy to that that makes it very interesting where he's just like he knows he's screwed for loving her mm-hmm. but he can't help it and that's and he's not just, yeah yeah he's not just like the perfect handsome prince you know who has no flaws or whatever yeah. remember he's trying to write poems for her and he can't make like simple rhymes yeah and he doesn't know he's trying to ask molly for advice about how to write poetry to her because he tries and he is not very good at it and he's, so he's kind of humbled that way, which is interesting because it's not like the typical, yeah. It, it's like kind of real care, real people, I want to say. Some of them are people. <laughs> King, Har- um, King Haggard is very interesting, too, because, I mean, the characters themselves, Schmedrick and Mal- or at least Schmedrick, I think, admits that even though King Haggard has the whole land sort of cursed and held hostage for his own quest to find stimulation, he, he, you're somewhat sympathetic for him. Like, I think Schmedrick mm-hmm. even says, like, he, he, as much as Haggard is like a bully, he he sort of likes him. And he mm-hmm. ends up fighting with him at some point. But he's interesting because yeah. you, you see ha- King Haggard is sort of tortured by his own predicament. Yeah. You know? True. I just think that all the characters are very different and very memorable. What about magic in this world? It's kind of an interesting thing because it's definitely there are elements of magic. You have You start off with the unicorn who's magical. It's commented by these hunters in the, who are, she overhears them talking in the woods where she lives that they're not going to be able to find any game because they believe a, a unicorn's there and it's the last unicorn, which sort of inspires her to start her quest. Besides that, there's the magical butterfly, which we talked about. There's mm-hmm. also the, the harpy. I mean, I, I really liked the fact, as soon as there was a real harpy in this story, I was like, okay, I really like this story. It, it wasn't just that, that Mommy Fortuna was just going to be like an illusionist to everyone that like there was other magical beasts in this world and they were going right. to you know have some consequence you know it ends up killing mommy fortuna and there's the red bull i mean and then there's like a talking skeleton and then there's a talking cat oh yeah but then there's schmedrick's magic which he can sometimes mm-hmm. do magic but in the beginning we see he, when he tries to help the unicorn escape he tries to break her out of her cage using magic and it ends up backfiring yeah and owns up almost yeah. ki- killing her by making it ends up causing right. the cage to get smaller. He ends up having to use just common like lock or just, he, he just has the keys, right? Yeah. He just lets her out he using the keys. The whole time. Yeah. He did he yeah. pickpocket. Like part of his struggle and uh, is that he, he just, he can do magic, but he doesn't have any real control over it. Sort of like, yeah. you ever seen that TV show, the greatest American hero from like the eighties? I have not seen it, but I've heard of it. Yeah. It's about a guy who can't control his powers, but whatever. So, I mean, okay. that, that's who Schmedrick is. He he can't control his powers, but then in a pinch, he can do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and magic is all about, is, he's all about magic and trying to be the next, you know, great magician. And he's mm-hmm. very, you know, he's very kind of down on himself that he won't be able to do it, or but at the same time very determined to do it, even though he kind of has failed over and over. But it just kind of highlights the importance of magic to him that is basically his life and so when he meets you know the unicorn he's like i'm going to go with you you know i'm your journey because i you know he's met this magical creature and she kind of represents everything you know and he recognizes her and not everyone can do that yeah but it kind of shows yeah he wants to be a part of you know her journey so it's like this magic is kind of like center it's never it's kind of a, a big theme you know in the book, both as, you know, the things that we see and also the motivation behind, you know, one of the major characters, Schmendrick, is all about, you know, like I said, wanting to learn magic and be a great magician. So, And we find out from Mabrook that Schmedrick is sort of known for being an apprentice of, I think, Nike? Yeah. As Nikos? Be- Nikos, maybe. Yeah, Nikos. Nikos. Yeah. That he is going to, he is this great and powerful wizard. There's like a prophecy. Like every fantasy mm-hmm. story, there's a prophecy, and Schmedrick's going to feel it. 
And this book has those tropes like you would expect in a fantasy book. And you know Schmedrick is going to come through in the clinch. But it still comes across authentic. It doesn't feel like... It doesn't feel predictable even though it is. Mm -hmm. The way this story is is told, I feel like, is, is very authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah, you start to wonder, is she going to be a woman and, you know, go for the love? You know, because a lot of, yeah. you know, these fairy tales, like, end in, like, the love story and the prince and the princess, you know, living happily ever ever after. But then uh, there's this whole quest that she's on from the get from the beginning. So what's going to happen? Um, so, yeah, and then, the, you know, just to leave, the, to have the prince end up, you know, without his, without a wife and whatever. He's still going to be a king, but it's kind of, it takes the fairy tale and kind of turns it over and doesn't go where you would expect it to go. Yeah, it's kind of more it's kind of more about the secondary characters if you, yeah. if you want to use the word secondary cuz yeah, I think like Schmender kind of turns out to be more of a hero I think than the prince, you know, the prince would as people would expect. Yeah, but the prince has his own arc it, it, yeah. which is interesting. I mean, I feel like there's real consequences in this story that make it unique. The fact that the, the prince is not just going to end up with a princess at the end. He, he does end up with a princess, mm-hmm. but he doesn't end up with the Lady Amalthea. She doesn't decide, yeah. like, maybe like a Disney film. Like, she's just going to, okay, stay <laughs> human and be with him forever or something. Yeah. Like, she's going to exactly. leave. That's what I was Disney film. <laughs> yeah, she's going to leave him, and that sucks. But it's kind of like right. what has to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. and, and Like what she, would, she set out to do. Yeah, and I kept thinking, like, when Mommy Fortuna comes on the scene very early on and they have to deal with her. I kept waiting for her to come back. And this Maybe this has, has to happen with... <laughs> maybe this has to do with Peter S. Beagle's writing style. You know, there's two different... Well, there's two major different writing styles. There's Sometimes they call them pantsers and plotters, people who sort of write by the seat of their pants and people who plot the whole thing out ahead of time. Okay. I feel like Peter S. Beagle, I think he's kind of said he's more of like a pantser. Like he kind of makes it up as he, as he goes. And maybe this story was written that way and maybe that's how it shakes out. But... Like, you know, I, I thought, Ma, you know, Mommy Fortuna was going to appear again or, you know, it was all going to come full circle, but it doesn't. Like, she she is undone by her own greed, her own pride, her own ambition. Yep. And Schmedrick yep. p- points this out early on. You know, she made, like, three mistakes. One of, I think, is, is by actually, you know, getting a real magical creature, the harpy, and then getting the unicorn, another real magical creature. And he's like, she's kind of in over her head and she doesn't realize it. Yeah. And then ends up being her yeah. undoing. And it's not like a typical fairy tale where it's like, or a Disney story where, you know, they defeat her and in the end she tries to go after them again and, and then they defeat her again. Like, no, <laughs> the harpy is let free by the unicorn and it kills her. And that's it. Mm-hmm. My Fortuna is taken right. the F out. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was, that was unexpected, especially for, um, I mean, I don't know if this was marketed as a children's novel to begin with, but the film, I mean, certainly. I feel like it is. I feel like this can be considered young adult. I mean, I think it, it like a lot of yeah, good. Yeah, young adult at least. Yeah, it could be enjoyed mm-hmm. by any age, but it's definitely sort of a young yeah. adult tale. But that point in the film, I don't know if we're... Are we in the book or the film? We're just in the book. We're just in the book. We can get in the film. Okay. We can get in okay. the film next. But yeah, both. I mean, yeah. When just the that scene, just when the harpy is attacking her, it's serious. Serious business. Kind of, yeah. It, that's yeah. Yeah. It's kind of dark. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say if he had the whole thing planned out to begin with, or if he was just kind of winging it as he went. But I think I mean the final product was it was interesting. It wasn't it, you know. Yeah. It, it comes together. I mean, there's in the in, mm-hmm. in Schmedrick. I mean, there's <laughs> the familiar. It, it's got this interesting air of familiarity and yet being different and authentic by itself. Like at some point, Schmedrick mm-hmm. conjures his own illusion and summons Robin Hood to come and right. distract the bandits. It mm-hmm. literally has Robin Hood in the story, but it's just an illusion, and that you know is familiar. Mm-hmm. But yet, you know, it's just used as an illusion to get him out of a jam. And then he ends up, you know, uh, escaping be- because of this or whatever, or, or, or kind of like mm-hmm. be- befriending Molly Gru because of that. But it's got all these sort of familiar tropes, but he just manages to twist them enough that, you know, it, it's not quite a direct parody. 
it's not like he just took a classic tale and just like, I'm going to do a parody of it. Like, you know, Lord of the Rings, I think um, National Lampoon did a version of it called Board of the Rings, you know, which is an obvious mm-hmm. parody of Lord of the Rings. This is a, this is a sort of has parody elements, but it's not a straight parody. It's its own thing. Right. Yep. It's kind of a retaking of the fairy tale and just making it a new kind of fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, different kind of fairy tale than what you're used to. I mean, I, I don't know, and, and this didn't even really occur to me until we were talking, but the fact that it has kind of the unicorn, you know, end up going back into it. She's a woman, but she turns back into the unicorn. She doesn't end up with the prince. Yeah. Almost kind of like feminist elements to it, and we don't have to get into oh, that really. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I, I didn't think of it before. Just having her, you know, not have the traditional ending, and she kind of goes her own way again. Yeah, she's not the just end. there to fulfill the prince's needs. Mm-hmm. Even though it's yeah, but it, on the other hand, yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though it's explained that the prince, he's a hero and he wants to win her heart, but he ultimately mm-hmm. doesn't get to. Right. Yeah, I thought it was kind of a, and then he had the you know the the, the woman in the end comes to him, which I kind of thought was kind of they have to do that, you know, because it's like it was ending this way, but then there's still he's still going to end up with someone, and yeah. it's kind of like I didn't know that that part was really necessary it was kind of that's a good question i don't know it, it, it's just co- sort of suggesting that you needed to have like this love life yeah and because he, he's a this, hero this random woman just gonna replace her like lady amalthea like the same day she left you know well but <laughs> i feel like that's replacement. isn't that playing or on the feeling? the parody elements of fairy tale like this is the he's a hero and so that's what he needs to do as a hero but the unique part is the unicorn is going to go off on her own. He's not going to get her. She's gone. Yeah. No, he's getting someone else most, most likely. Yeah. But, but who, yeah. We're, who we're not in, really invested in mm-hmm. as the reader. Right. You know. And then that way, he's still not getting too far away from fairy tale because it still is yeah. like a fairy tale. So, but it's a fairy tale that things happen where you don't, like we keep saying, things happen where you don't expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really great story. That's kind of the 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 end of the comments I had. I, what, is there anything else you wanted to mention for the book? Uh, I guess I have a the perspective I have is that I had actually seen the film long before reading the book. Mm-hmm. I had I think I had heard of the movie and I was like, oh, animated film and unicorns that came out in the eighties. I didn't know about this growing up for some reason. And so I saw the book, and then I read the, uh, or excuse me, I saw the movie, and then I saw the book, like, years later. I think I was in college when I first saw the movie years ago. And so just from that perspective, it was interesting to read the book and recognize so much from the, the film. And I know I'm getting to the film. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, and then reversing that, it's like, oh, okay. So, so they kept a lot that was in the book because mm-hmm. it has a lot of, I think, cinematic you can kind of picture a lot of it happening. And yes. a lot of, like I said, his, his prose and his dialogue is very lyrical and it, it fits well into a fairy tale type movie. So they did end up like keeping a lot of his writing. Mm-hmm. He did write the screenplay. So that probably has a lot to do with it, but he kept a lot of his original, you know, quotes and actually some of the funny stuff too, which was, I was glad to, um, I reading it later. I, you the, know, I don't remember if I ever saw the film, growing up i i think I, I was definitely aware of it i don't know if like my sister saw it or something but i don't in, know why i didn't yeah in reading this i kept thinking this reads like a animated tale like i couldn't wait to watch the movie because <laughs> i was like i was picturing all of it i was like oh i can totally yeah. see this as a cartoon i can totally see this as, uh, you know everything that he wrote and i i kept trying to think did i see this as a, when i was a kid i don't recall seeing it first but it all just I felt feel like familiar. I feel remember it, yeah. 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 It just felt familiar in the way he wrote it. I think it just lended itself to being sort of a very visual story. Yeah. And Agreed. musical. Lyrical. Like, mm-hmm. like you know, an, a Disney animation that we're, you know, we're, we're all familiar with those. Right. Yeah. So I see what you're saying. I, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, if that's <laughs> about it, then we can go into our final comments and star ratings (laughs) 
how many stars would you give this out of five? And then is there any like last kind of comment that you'd want to say about the book before we wrap things up here? Okay. I ended up giving this a three and a half out of five. Whoa. With me, I, I don't give a lot of five star ratings. I'm very picky. Oh, um, you're stingy. I want, it's, maybe, but <laughs> I don't want to just throw out five stars like, you know, it's everybody's birthday and, you know, everyone gets a five star rating. I, for me, a three and a half is a solid rating. I think it's better than average. It's not so good that I'm like telling everybody about it, although I am enjoying talking about it now. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I might end up upping it a half star to a four star because Uh I'm getting more out of it, having this discussion, and I'm thinking it's revealing more layers to me Mm -hmm. that I didn't think of before, having talking to someone else about it. So To your smart cousin? We'll we'll hover, (laughs) we'll teeter between the, yeah, exactly, (laughs) between the three and a half to four star for me. Yeah, I say like solid, you know, solid story, well paced. It, it's not a book you just slug through and you know pick up every once in a while. You get through it pretty fast. Like I said, it flows very, like musically in a way, like it's very lyrical, and the characters are great, which we already discussed. So in yeah. unicorns, I, I feel like just the topic itself, the title, really catches you because most times you read about or see unicorns in film, they're just kind of a side character or this, like, elusive thing up in the distance that never really gets their own story. And I don't really know any other books that besides maybe some of other Peter Beagle's other stories or novels, like the Unicorn Sonata. But I've never, I had never read anything that featured a unicorn as the main prominent character before. And I thought that was cool. So, so yeah, good, solid book. Definitely. And I am, <laughs> I'm going to give this five stars. Okay. And I, I, I almost debated that a little bit, but and, and I, I'm sure I'm affected by the fact that I know that this is so beloved as a book. But that said, and even though I didn't love all the lyrics in the book, all the songs, I, I was like, this. I don't know what else I would have wanted out of this book. I feel like mm-hmm. he hit the notes I needed him to hit. I mean, the consequences in this felt real. That was huge to me. The ending was just very strong. I mean, you have a good point about the princess at the end. Is that necessary or not? Mm, I don't know. We can discuss that more in the movie episode. But the fact that the unicorn doesn't turn back into a human and goes off on her own and the prince has to deal with that and she has to deal with the fact that she at one point was a human and loved a prince. I mean, I was like, hmm, that's a bittersweet ending and that's powerful. And I was like, that is Mm kind of perfect. What else did I really want from this book? And the characters, like, like you just said and we talked about before, are memorable and it's a quick read, and I was like, "This, this is it. This is yeah. it. this is." I can see that how this is a classic, you know, American fantasy. Yeah. And I think that there, I, yeah. there is layer, layers, and it's interesting that you say that because I think that I've noticed on this show and doing this in the past that 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 does happen, where you you think okay. about a book and then you have some time to reflect it about it, and then you talk about it with people, and, and, and unless yeah. you're, unless you're in a book club, you don't necessarily get to talk about books with people a lot. But it, it makes you really appreciate sure. it more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely true. Yeah. And just peeling back the layers and kind of yeah. examining it closely. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I read a book, I finish it. I might write a little review on Goodreads if it really kind of moves me to do so, but not for every book. And I, I'll put it on my shelf a month later, I'll pick it up. And I'm like, I don't even remember what I read. Like, I, yeah. I remember it being good, but I don't remember who was in it. I don't remember, you know, the writing and the overall, you know, meaning I got out of it. But yeah, when you take the time to kind of peel back the layers and, and analyze and and look at the characters and the writing itself and all that, it it kind of, it makes it more, there's more substance to it for sure. And it, I mean, I didn't mention this, but Schmendrick, I love like Schmendrick is my favorite character. And I'll get more into that. I'm sure with the film because like I said my first experience with this was the film version I had seen the film long before and he was my favorite character there and I think he's probably my favorite character in the book as well and they're not exactly the same I think he's a little bit more quirky and silly not silly that's probably the wrong word but 
kind of awkward <laughs> in in the film version. Mm. But yeah, that that helps too. I love that character. Yeah. So. Well, and I yeah. I don't think all books lend themselves to this. I mean, certainly you're going to get more out of books when you discuss them. But I think when you discuss them, you discover you discover more of the depths. And some books really hold up to the discussion. And, and you see mm-hmm. that there's so much more. And I, I think this is one of those books. Yeah. Which is why I'm going to give it the five star. I agree. All That's right. And, <laughs> and people can uh, eventually look you up on Goodreads and see, did you give a three or did you give a four? Because a Goodreads <laughs> doesn't, doesn't allow half stars. So you'll have to put it in the notes or you'll have to just That's co- right. And commit. I did that. I had put three stars and then I had put three and a half stars. But I'll probably write more because I feel like I have more to say on it now. Oh. So, yeah, but it, it will. I'll have to figure that out. So I'm going to go, you know, keep the three and a half or go up to the four at least. Very good. We'll see. We'll see. Now, like we mentioned in the beginning of the show, you sometimes and occasionally do a video blog about your book reviews when you're not just putting uh, reviews on Goodreads. And I think if, do people just search you on YouTube doing Kaylin Reads or, or Kaylin O'Reilly and maybe your, yeah. your channel will come up? Yeah, you can find my channel if you do a search on YouTube. It's just Kaylin Reads. That's K-A-E-L-I-N space reads. And, um, yeah, it should pop up. I've got, yeah, i got some book reviews. I've got book hauls when I buy a bunch of books or I, I show you a bunch of books that I have and I talk about them, tell you about what I plan on reading and what I've read for the month. I, it was a, I've done book car vlogs where I was in my car just talking about books. I think a lot, it's getting kind of more popular. People are in their cars. and Oh. And, uh, that's interesting. And filming, which I don't know, it, it can be. I I could see that becoming, you know, something not very safe. But <laughs> well, um, it depends. Yeah, it depends I, on I did, you know how you do it. But I've noticed like some like podcasts I listen to will will do that, where you mm-hmm. know just to get the recording done, they'll do it while they're doing other things. Like with the technology right. we have available now, I mean, there's so much you can do just with your phone. You could easily do a video yeah. blog from your phone. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I don't have a ton up there, but I enjoy doing it, so I'll have more, and um, it's fun. It's, YouTube is a great way to get, talk about things that you love, and there's a lot of other people who talk about books on there. They call it BookTube, as opposed to YouTube. It's kind of its own community of people, but there's tons of people who talk about all different kinds of books, but, yeah, I like it, so. Cool. If you want to check it out, that's where you find me. Excellent. So we <laughs> encourage our listeners to go check out your video blog on YouTube and check you out on Goodreads. They can follow the podcast and check out our website at nodeodorant.com. We're also on TuneIn Radio. We're on Stitcher. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, pretty much almost all places you can get podcasts, you can find this podcast. And you can also find a version of it on YouTube itself. So we ask anyone to go and check us out and write reviews. We'd appreciate that. And tune in later in the month when we cover the film, The Last Unicorn. Until then, we'll say goodnight. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. For more information on the topics discussed in this episode, or to read our show notes and find us on social media, visit nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. The theme music for this podcast was written by John Doyle from the band I Decline. You can visit him at i-decline.com. Voiceover for this podcast was provided by me, Margaret O'Reilly. Well, that concludes our episode. We hope you've learned a lot. Again, thanks for listening to our show. And always, always remember, there is no deodorant in outer space. Um, I'm going to have mine open, and since I'm not using Skype, I, I think my computer will be able to handle all this fancy business. It can't handle it. It can't handle it. You take a selfie with the book and send it to me at some point. <laughs> okay. Can you- okay, just making sure because I uh, put that um, do not disturb and I don't think it would affect the call that I'm on, but <laughs> shouldn't. It better not. Oh, it better not. 
Oh, I'm all over the place. Okay. Let me turn down the ambient noise. It's getting a little less ambient. Wait, I got to make the words bigger because I'm old now. Okay. Yeah, I had to do that too. <laughs> in five, in four, in three, in two, in one.